In this episode, I'm joined once again by the author Chad Haag to discuss his book, The Later Philosophy of Penti Linkola. In this episode, we discuss the deep ecology of Penti Linkola alongside discussions on the environment, sustainability, consumerism, and ecology. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Metics Podcast or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. So, Chad Hogg, thanks once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having me. We are discussing um, your book, The Later Philosophy of Penti Linkola. Um, neither of us are actually too sure on the pronunciation, but uh, that is sort of, as you said, the Americanized version. Uh, Penti Linkola was a... he died not too long ago, I believe it was last year. Um, he was a Finnish deep ecologist and writer of ecology but it's not ecology in the contemporary sense where we all have this super lovey-dovey we all get along and it just works out via some magic words such as sustainable and you know eco-friendly and things like this um if you want to read someone who in my opinion truly goes to the lengths to say no 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 you know this is what we have to do this is how we have to live linkler is your man um, and it's not easy reading for people who are in their sort of comfortable Western lives. But Chad, you've written a book called The Later Philosophy of Penty Linkla, which I guess is sort of done because the only other text which is translated in English is Can Life Prevail, which focuses is, or focuses on Linkler's early work. Um, so really, we only have these two texts in English. Uh, about his work at all. There's probably a few essays translated and things along these lines, and I've seen a few um, documentaries which he's was in, been given subtitles. But um, so, how how did this book come about, and uh, why why did you decide to write it? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to have this discussion with you. One reason why I wrote a book on Linkler's philosophy is because. The term environmentalism has basically become meaningless. Everybody knows that the same CEOs, corporate employees, media, Democrat Party politicians, and Hollywood celebrities who are the very worst defenders against the environment all somehow claim to be environmentalists just because it's politically correct to do so. Linkola actually does provide an alternative to this hypocrisy, but I think that Linkola's philosophy might be best understood through uh, comparison with an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents that a young man named Seymour plots to uh, kill his aunt to get access to his inheritance, and he disguises himself as a fictitious person named Antonio Batani to do so. He feels he's committed the perfect crime until he realizes that when the police interview locals for details on Antonio, there's only one thing they can all agree on. That's that both Antonio and Seymour have the same large birthmark on the face one which he simply spent his entire life pretending not to see. He was, however, the only one who couldn't see a birthmark which was obvious to everyone else. And on environmental grounds, one might compare this to when Facebook opened a data center in Upper Finland near the North Pole to uh, unanimous applause by the global intelligentsia on grounds that this was the eco-friendly option, simply because le uh, less energy was required for cooling purposes. In reality, of course, the birthmark of ecological contradiction remained that even the so-called eco-friendly option still required enormous inputs of hardware, which consume many times their weight in fossil fuels to be produced and then shipped across the globe only to burn out rather quickly and then have to be replaced by even more hardware inputs. Social media giants think they've committed the perfect crime against nature and then gotten away with it by paying lip service to politically correct cliches of environmentalism, which are so empty as to be meaningless. But the birthmark of ecological contradiction is still really there for anyone with enough guts to acknowledge it. I think um, the 1980s Hollywood film They Live is another good um a film reference to understand Linkler because it tells the story of a man who uh, found a pair of sunglasses which reveal that some of the people in the population are actually aliens sent to the earth to take it over from within. In this sense, Linkler is basically the man who found the deep ecology sunglasses and is trying to expose the birthmark of ecological contradiction for the rest of us, you see. In fact, the point of his work is to show that nearly everything that passes as real in our world is just an ecologically impossible object in disguise. 
he dissects them one by one, such as uh, universal automation, universal sanitation, universal veganism, universal animal rights, and of course, the worst one of all, global overpopulation. So those we'll probably get into. I mean, I'm interested on the veganism and the sanitation. My favorite essay by Linkler, which I think we sort of have to touch on, which has become a meme, is the... Uh, the moldy, the moldy jam essay, and him stirring the mold back into the jam, and this whole how he utilizes the concept of hygiene to realize how utterly ridiculous um, our sort of attempts to be sanitary are. Um, but that might come. Actually, you know, we could we could put that in now. I mean, perhaps we'll start with this sanitation idea, if you, if if you're okay with that, to sort of look at how Linkala, you know, sees ecology sees the environment sees nature so yeah if you could expand on you know how Linkler sees sanitation that would be great right so in a well-known essay called humbug Linkler observed that health inspectors have not actually made us more healthy they have destroyed our health it's proven by the way that uh, first world People's immune systems have been weakened to the point that any uh, Western tourist who travels to Egypt, uh, Peru, Vietnam, etc., will probably get sick eating the same food, which locals have no problem with. Uh, this is something which I found out firsthand when I traveled to India for the first time years ago. On an economic level, universal sanitation also drives up unemployment because all of the regulations are just a euphemism for everything being at exactly the right temperature for exactly the right time, sanitized with exactly the right blend of chemicals, which is, of course, just a euphemism for a huge amount of money, which only a handful of corporate monopolies can afford. Even considered purely as a technology, though, universal sanitation is incredibly inefficient because some 40% of food produced in the United States ended up in the trash, even as some one-sixth of the population faced hunger even before the pandemic began. Universal sanitation is therefore something of an ecologically impossible scenario, which on a metaphysical level um, is devoid of being, but it's also deeply unethical and would be worthy of serious punishment in an ideal society okay okay so why do you think it is you know we live it we, we we in the west we now have this compulsion you know we have this sell by day or use by day and for many people as soon as that use by day is over you know let's say oh it goes out of date on the 25th today's the 24th you know the next day they're like right it's out of date even though that every one of their senses you know looking at maybe this package of bread or this piece of meat tells them it's absolutely fine what do you why do you where do you think that compulsion comes from to sort of give into basically just this artificial idea of perfect hygiene well i think it's a luxury of living in an era of uh, cheap easily accessible abundant fossil fuels this is the only thing which could allow um, an attitude which is historically anomalous even compared to the recent past uh, Winkler's own experience in the 1950s of how fishermen would um you know, take their fish around town without having it at exactly the right temperature, exactly the right time with the right blend of chemicals, something which I see, by the way, on a, a daily basis here in India. I live on the coast of the Arabian Sea, where I see exactly um, what Linkola uh, mentioned decades ago going on the West. You still have that in the third world. And the reason is quite simple. We don't have the fossil fuel um, per capita in India that is taken for granted in the West. So we really couldn't afford this uh, way of doing things, which uh, the uh, West also will not be able to sustain into the indefinite future. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, you know, you mentioned Linkola's fishing there, and I think I, I think one part of Linkola's biography, um, which is sort of important to mention, is he walks the talk, right? He lives in the same small hut he's basically his entire life goes everywhere by bike or via horse and is just a a i don't i think he has like one plate doesn't have what you know doesn't have washing up water or any like anything close to what we consider you know in quotation marks modern so in terms of people who've genuinely can genuinely sincerely say they care about the environment lincola is in the very small camp of people who actually do <laughs> 
Greg, he actually um, came from an academic family, and everybody expected him to uh, follow in his uh, his father's footsteps and uh, be like uh, an academic scientist. Um, it was precisely because he learned too much about ecology that he realized he had to uh, be a fisherman, a traditional fisherman instead. Hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so for Linkler, I mean, we might have touched on the, these ideas when we spoke about Ted Kaczynski, but... Why, for Linkola, do do we as a society ha- dislike criticism of you know technology of all these technological comforts that we've that we've got? Well, I think we dislike criticism of modern technology because modern technology allows the gap uh, between pursuing what Linkola, um, basically my own term, an ecologically impossible situation. Um, Uh, between pursuing it and finding out that it is not viable, this is something which modern technology allows us to maybe extend, uh, but it does not allow us to actually overcome it. And therefore, modern technology is basically for Linkola what Kant would call metaphysics. It allows you to seem to overstep the limits of ecological reality, but it really just causes a certain transcendental illusion in which something seems to appear where there's actually just nothing. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I've never really thought about it like that. So, in in modern society, we sort of just use we we, but there's a belief there, of course, that we are going to keep going. That technology is always going to keep going, right? Well, if you look closely at the kinds of solutions which modern technology offers, specifically for ecological problems, they are often just as bad as whatever they try to solve. Um, when Jane Fonda, uh, for example, was arrested in 2019 after flying all the way from California to Washington, D.C. to protest against the same global warming she was herself causing, she remarked later that uh, she was relocating to D.C. full time so she could get arrested every week so she could be in the news every week. She claimed that she had to do this because she had already done everything else she possibly could for the environment, such as driving a hybrid car. She completely missed the point that electric cars are every bit as ecologically unsustainable, and the only viable alternative is to just walk or bicycle. Um, Similarly, uh, Thomas Friedman's Hot, Flat, and Crowded is a book in which he claimed that the solution to global warming could be as simple as having corporate professionals take one for the team by just using video conferencing software instead of flying all over the world for international business trips. In other words, he promised that Skype will save the world. But this fantasy actually did come true amidst the global lockdown, but we know a year later that people's overall consumption actually did not go down, even if they spent slightly less energy commuting to work. I think Friedman really just missed the deeper point that this expectation that anyone with a quote-unquote real job will have to do international business trips is misses the point that this corporate aristocracy of office drones, which he presumes are the only normal people, is itself parasitic upon a global technological system which is ecologically unsustainable and which will in fact guarantee human extinction if left intact. Um, He can easily imagine a world of uh, Zoom meetings, but he cannot imagine a world of agrarian peasants, let alone hunter-gatherers or nomadic herdsmen, despite the fact that these are some of the only ecologically viable options for the far future. I mean, but this is the, this is sort of the double bind that people always find themselves in. I mean, it's funny that you mention, um, Hybrid cars. I mean, it's one of my favorite favorite examples of sort of that modern day sort of spiel. You know, that this it is basically a Western society wants to eat their cake and have it too, right? They want to uh, maintain the illusion that they're saving the world, saving the planet, saving the environment, but at the same time, they want the the gizmos, the gadgets, the tech, which is the thing which is destroying the environment. So they still want to be able to drive, which is you know, the primary thing, which is destroying the environment. But they want to do that in a way where they don't feel guilty. So they just buy a new car. And of course, you, you, you mentioned that that third option is so, so abhorrent to most people. How about you don't drive? But that's abhorrent, right? No one, we can't, the problem we're, we're stuck in is we deem ourselves unable to go back, right? We are, we are in a society which just cannot accept return can't go okay you know what we made a mistake this isn't as good we need to go back and it's funny i was listening to the radio the other day and um this is in the uk and sort of some government scheme had given a two million pound grant to um make this certain factory somewhere more efficient and you know as soon as i hear that word i think oh god but luckily for me they'd given an interview to um 
what, like the manager there, and he seemed very honest, you know, in comparison to most people. And he said, "Oh, you know, this whole system is now in place. Um, it doesn't seem as good as the the way we used to do things so far, but we'll see." And you know, there was this sort of you could tell that there was this bind in his mind where you know he didn't want to have to sort of throw it in their face, but. Usually upgrade, innovation, improvement. We all know what this means. It just means things are going to get worse, but look better, right? Do you, do you think there's, you know, there's something in that idea that we, we, we find it impossible to sort of return to a previous state? Yeah, I think of a 2011 interview which uh, Linkler had with uh, Francisco Martinez and Larissa Venamo, in which uh, they asked him why no amount of scientific information, which we don't exactly have a shortage of um, in the modern world, um, can actually get people to change their behavior. Um, he answered with just three words, which were as long as. As long as people still can vacation internationally or buy cars or shop in malls, eat fast food, they will. Um, on a formal level, as long as any gap remains between pursuing an impossible situation and realizing that it can't actually be completed, we'll still continue acting out. And this is why Linkola actually associates desire with death and associates life with natural necessity. Because these artificial desires, which are sort of created by or developed by corporations or businesses these are the things which lead us to do things which are against our natural inclination right desire for linkola allows you to imagine anything even if it's ecologically impossible and um desire really goes with language because language allows you to construct an elaborate illusion which eventually becomes indistinguishable from reality um in linkola's um um, terms necessity is what uh, has to adhere to the strict system of ecological law, even when it contradicts what we wish were the case. And the problem with democracy is really for Linkola that it is a political system based solely on this kind of desire. Um, he noted in an essay called um, What is Majority and What is Minority that um, partisan conflict in the West is actually largely an illusion. Both parties promise the same economic growth despite environmental damage because both are held hostage to the same politics of desire rather than politics of necessity. He notes that this is not a contradiction of the ideal of democracy because it's precisely when the right to vote is universalized that political parties realize that a numerical majority can only be acquired through buying votes with giveaways that are all eco-crimes in disguise. In fact, uh, political parties don't even limit themselves to meeting uh, pre-existing desires people already have. They actually work to artificially generate new desires that did not exist before, despite the fact that all of these desires are just euphemisms for a certain ecological impossibility in disguise. Um, for Linkola, any political system based on desire is fundamentally flawed because desire will always choose ecological impossibility. It will always choose um, the birthmark, if we consider the episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Um, only necessity will choose um, ecological form. And this is why democracy for Linkola is simply the political formation based on desire and the green police, which basically force people to live on uh, ecologically sustainable grounds, is a political formation of necessity. Okay, and I mean, this is where probably most um, contemporary theorists or people who are working in the environmental field would completely switch off from Linkola and deem him, you know, silly because he is highly, highly critical of democracy. And, you know, he emphasizes that this idea of a government which gives us what we need versus what we want. And he sort of brings forward, I don't know if you'd agree, a form of like totalitarian or no, totalitarian is probably the wrong word because they control every facet of society. I don't think he wants that, but he wants an authoritarian government which puts ecology as the primary, you know, the primary idea. Um, so what do you think, you know, this, this, what, the, what's the difference then for Linkola between what we need and what we, what we want? What do we, what do we need? I think would be a good question. 
Right. So a great example of how what we need and what we want are at odds with one another is a Linklow's own example that in an ideal society, weight just would be low and the costs of raw materials would be high. This would maximize human employment while minimizing the use of resources and pollution. Uh, the mind of man, of course, doesn't want these things. He wants high salaries and cheap materials. And in the West, we have um, just mandated these things formally, and the result has been widespread unemployment and unspeakable environmental damage, a pollution, waste, and actually a life that is less satisfactory overall, even for the people lucky enough to find employment there. In contrast, um, a government based on on um, natural limitation for Linkola um, is something he's actually extremely specific about what that would look like. You note that um, you'd have to have a drastic reduction in a cereal grain production. You'd have to eat nutritious, low, unfashionable fish, which can be sustainably harvested. You can eat some species of rodents also instead. Um, you'd have to have a coordinated destruction of any machine which steals a person's job, no matter how convenient it might seem to be. You'd have to have food preservation be the job of individual households rather than of major corporations who, once again, waste some 40 percent of all food in the United States. Um, you'd have to have localized transportation networks, even to the extent of criminalizing suburban sprawl and needless building construction. You'd have to rule out energy waste by literally making sailing against the wind illegal. Needless to say, there would be no personal cars because the only options would be walking, skiing, bicycling, or paddling. You'd have to stop producing plastic in the first place. Then there would be no need to find a way to deal with all of it. You'd have to remove house cats from many homes because they will hunt wild birds and negate even the greatest efforts at wildlife preservation in certain habitats. You'd have to destroy power plants with the full realization that the rest of the technological system will collapse as a result of intentionally tipping the first domino in an interconnected system. And of course, the most controversial is the world should be billions of people less populated. So you have to dismantle the myth of the freedom of procreation by having the green police grant licenses allowing reproduction only to those who have been deemed worthy. Don't you think, though, that um, once you remove various facets and outlets of, of modern technology that the the growth rate would would decrease you know naturally because we no longer have all these sort of artificial apparatus allowing you know not to sound too uh, pessimistic and and realist about it but not allowing those who normally wouldn't live to to live Right. It bears mentioning that overpopulation is an ecologically impossible object in the very specific sense that, um, as Michael Rupert noted, it was forbidden by the natural cycle uh, in which the soil could be replenished in agrarian context um, by only so much manure each season. It was only fossil fuels which interfered with this natural cycle and overstepped the limit of overpopulation. Despite the fact that it is completely unsustainable, even when examined on a quantitative level, some 85% of water consumption in the United States is by the agricultural industry, yet the um, aquifers they're depleting are only replenished uh, some 0.1% each year by natural rainfall. Global population really cannot exceed 2 billion people under any other circumstances. So in very blunt terms, this means, as Michael Rupert noted, that a massive die-off is unavoidable, in which population figures revert to their pre-modern norms, if only by sheer ecological necessity. Linkla differs from other thinkers, however, by knowing that this reduction of human population might seem like the ultimate moral evil, but from an ecological standpoint, it would actually be the ultimate good, because in a very real sense, all of our other eco-crimes are parasitic upon this one hmm okay so in what sense then for Linkola would a sort of a green police you know what criteria would people have to meet to be able to allowed to be allowed to have children or be able to procreate well, he has uh, you know, a number of specific criteria. Um, the fitness of the parents on, on many levels intellectually is one. Um, uh, physical fitness is another, um, you know, various uh, things. But um, the idea that we have any alternative, um, I think, is a delusion. Uh, there really is no way um, out of um, 
respecting the limit of just 2 billion humans on this earth, however we get there. So, I mean, you know, not to sound, sound uh, or try pigeonhole him or try be too uh, hasty. Isn't that, isn't that like an eco-based eugenics? Um, I, I think that that might be an interpretation, but I, I think that um, Linkola is, is kind of ambiguous in this regard. And there's a number of different interpretations people might have about how exactly you would go about this. But once again, there really is no alternative, mm. um, you know, certainly not sustaining 7 billion humans or even more than that. Yeah, I mean, the 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 data in square quota- quotation marks supposedly states that it's the human population is going to plateau at nine billion and then slowly decrease, but it's still going to decrease down to a, a number which is you know fairly high. So I don't I don't know what Linkola would make of that. Um, but one interesting question there, I mean, with 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 just jumping back to technology, is of course, you know, people or people, modern society, I think, uh, has this sort of illusion of or, or delusion of, of what technology is you know when they when you say the word technology they think of super super high tech things such as computers or cars or um, gizmos gadgets you know apple watches these kind of things you know that's technology whereas any pretty much you know a hammer is technology so you know i think this is always an interesting question to ask for these the thinkers which are dealing with technologies what is the line for for them you know what is the line for linkola because obviously he had plates he had a he lived in a shack he did use um a a trailer on his horses with uh, reins etc so you know where is the line for linkola where we can say right you know this is as much technology as we we should have well, I think the line for Linkula is uh, simply the criteria of ecological impossibility. Um, it's um, quite fitting that uh, Jacques Ellul, for example, know that technique um, um, is actually not, or rather technology is not a set of physical machines. It is rather an artificial system of rationalization, which replaces a spontaneous free expression of nature with a coordinated method to maximize efficiency and adaptation. It will note, therefore, the paradox that the machine itself depends upon the system of rationalization, because that alone uh, uh, can tell it its proper location as a cog within the whole system, rather than the other way around. At its core, for Linkler as well, technology is just a certain abstraction of linguistification, which is shockingly lacking in positive being, despite being thoroughly materialistic. I think that Linkola uh, would group modern technology along with uh, language um, in that it allows for a certain unlimited madness, uh, which is uh, in contrast with ecology's adherence to a, a set of strict forms bound by natural law. And so this reason that um, Linkola's emphasis on the negativity of modern technology as that which has failed the ontological test of being precisely because it is ecologically impossible, something I think we have to um, reject the temptation to describe this with Marxist cliches, uh, specifically the Zizekian idea that uh, yeah, this uh, ecological impossibility is uh, like the gap of the real or the abstract negation which uh, sets a dialectic in motion by shaking the foundations of the current order and moving us forward to a more sophisticated stage. Um, at the very end of his uh, 2012 book, The Year of Dreaming Dangerously, Zizek actually did describe ecological crisis in exactly these terms. And you know, the book, by knowing that um, this emphasis on negativity for its own sake actually excused him and other communists from having to provide a detailed positive description of what the uh, coming post-capitalist order would look like or that would miss the whole point that abstract negation is exactly what provides the ontological conditions for this sort of openness to radical change yet this is exactly not how Linkola views the situation this led um, Zizek to claim that nature does not exist because one can only be a materialist if matter itself is desubstantialized into an illusion which vanishes amidst the paradox that something can only emerge if nothing negates itself um, for Linkle, on the other hand, nature is the only thing which does exist because nature is not a set of isolated natural objects, but is rather a fully rational system of ecological law, which you can never actually overstep. You can 
only fall for a certain delusion of modern technology and a linguistification, which make it seem that you could. And therefore, although um, ecological impossibility doesn't exist, it's not simply a uh, purely empty gap, which can only be described negatively. It's more like a linguistic message, which just happens to gesture towards a situation which can never be fully realized, kind of like how in mathematics, an asymptote uh, will remain inaccessible no matter how close you seem to get to reaching it, but you can still describe it with a definite numerical formula. Um, although an ecologically impossible situation for Link Linkola can never be fully realized, it can still eat up an enormous amount of resources in the real world while you fall for the seeming legitimacy of it on purely linguistic grounds. And therefore, the birthmark is more like a, a virus than a, a gap of nothingness, plain and simple. It's a set of instructions which hijack the host and induce it to replicate a certain algorithm of death until the host itself is killed. And this is why, you know, many of the contemporary... Uh, feats to, you know, hold or help the the ongoing environmental crisis. You know, these ideas of sustainability or eco friendly or environmentally friendly. These are all largely com just complete hoaxes, really, which buy into that same drive. Right. You could consider um, the clean energy hoax as uh, one of the worst examples of this. Um, Michael Rupert noted that um, there is no alternative energy because each one is not just a new source. It's a whole new infrastructure because uh, you can't store transport or, or burn the alternatives in a system currently used for petroleum. Um, no alternative, however, is concentrated enough to uh, pull itself out of the quicksand by its own bootstraps by um, providing enough energy to replace the entire infrastructural grid while simultaneously providing enough leftover energy to power everything else in the global economy and by the most delusional claims provide an even higher standard of living for all 7 billion humans. In fact, some so-called alternatives are actually net losers, which exist um, more for the purpose of making money off gullible investors and politicians than for actually uh, providing a return on that investment. And, and this really makes sense because uh, Michael Rupert noted that any claim to zero pollution is actually ruled out by the laws of thermodynamics themselves. These are just a marketing gimmick to do world governments into dumping tax funds into companies which will never actually make a profit, but can skate by on unearned wealth and promises they'll never fulfill. And therefore, it's not too different from a hamburger from a fast food drive through which still really contains trace amounts of cow manure. But because they've airbrushed all of the taste, smells, and sights of it, um, the uh, clean energy uh, gimmick also um, has all of the pollution costs uh, there, but are hidden from the public eye and are accepted as a technological simulation simply because we're already living in one. So uh, the Green New Deal, not going to work, hey, Chad? Um, I, I haven't been following the news by choice, um, but uh, I would assume that if it's being proposed by the Democrat Party um, and being praised by the corporate media, Hollywood celebrities and, uh, <laughs> and the like, I would assume it's just another ecologically impossible situation. So... I mean, you know, I've sort of already touched on this question, and this isn't specific to Linkola, but why do you personally think we, you know, I think most people can admit to these glaring, you know, the, the you know, the emperor's, is it the emperor's uh, clothes, you know, where the emperor's invisible, but no one wants to admit to it. I think driving down or being in the average traffic jam, most people can admit that this isn't normal, this can't be sustained when you think about it, but people go back into that sort of daze where they just believe it you know what what's truly stopping people breaking out of that is just just comfort i think it's uh um a fundamental mismatch between uh, what i call the mind of man which of course will always be held hostage by desire and the mind of nature which is really nobody's mind but is a, a system of uh, rationalized ecological laws which um, uh, are not um, to be uh, held accountable to any one person's desires. And Lincoln noted you can only have an ecologically sustainable government if it's founded not so much on any one person's opinion, but solely on this, uh, this mind of nature. Huh, okay. And that, you know, that's why you state for Lincoln that to be is to be ecological, you know, before anything, this is almost Heideggerian though, that, 
Um, to, to be is to be ecological before anything we have to um, understand and respect the limitations of our our world, our environment. But Linkola takes this very seriously on a practical level, as did Heidegger. Right. It has uh, too rarely been noticed, I think, that Linkola's Can Life Prevail and uh, Ted Kaczynski's Anti-Tech Revolution Winehow are remarkably similar texts in that each one provides uh, something of a Euclidean geometry for possible and impossible objects. It does so on political rather than mathematical grounds. Um, Kaczynski noted in uh, Anti-Tech Revolution uh, Winehow, for example, that a uh, self-predicting social system would violate Russell's paradox because a formal system cannot use its own resources to talk about itself recursively. And what this means in the real world is that it's uh, categorically impossible for any conscious agent to willfully steer the society in exactly the same direction he or she intends. Even if big historical changes do occur, they never unfold exactly as people envision that they would. Uh, for example, Enlightenment era intellectuals believe that the result of technological automation would be that everyone would have enough free time to compose classical music or write, you know, Renaissance style poetry. In reality, the boredom resulting from having all work done by machines just led people to binge on reality TV. Instead of having everyone become another Mozart or Shakespeare, people wasted their lives following every move by Kim Kardashian. On an even more serious level, um, no corporate CEO or engineer working to further technological progress on the ground level intends the outcome of that to be human extinction, but that's certainly what will happen if the current trajectory is allowed to reach its own logical conclusion. And whereas Kaczynski's background in uh, pure mathematics uh, led him to do this a sort of uh, test of whether something has being or not on uh, purely rational grounds, Linkle's own background in the life sciences, um, as well as his experience living naturally, led him to do this sort of work on strictly ecological grounds uh, by showing that nearly everything that passes as real in our world is actually an ecologically impossible object, um, which on a metaphysical level is uh, quite literally nothing at all. I cite the example in the book of the um, super obscure 2015 dystopian science fiction novel, The Doors You Mark Are Your Own, as a ridiculous book which somehow combines the mutually exclusive themes of extreme water shortage and alcoholism. A story about a medical student who has to basically promise to solve world thirst just to get an eight ounce cup of tea at a cafe, but then drops out of medical school and uh, spends all of his time getting wasted in shady bars, planning a pseudo Marxist revolution with his drinking buddies who are somehow able to waste limitless amounts of beer, despite the fact that they're too poor to afford water. It's interesting that if the authors of this book had spent just two minutes researching the topic online, they would have realized that some 155 liters of water are required just to produce one liter of beer. So this situation is quite literally ecologically impossible. And it proves that um, even when we try to imagine an eco-dystopia specifically defined by the ecological problem of water scarcity, we somehow still take for granted that limitless alcohol availability for the poor is a given. Yet this is just a very unclear way of uh, talking about a technological society awash in cheap, easily accessible, abundant fossil fuel energy, a certain modern technology which allows one to ignore ecological limitations, but only for a very short temporary period of time. I think Linkola differs from other ecological thinkers, though, and they points out that um, this is not merely a matter of uh, epistemological curiosity, but of ethics as well. Ecologically impossible objects are evil for Linkola precisely because they're not real. They don't exist, but deceive us uh, into thinking that they do. And it's once again because the mind of man is a fundamentally out of accord with the mind of nature. And this is why Linkola introduces the idea of... Uh eco crimes right you know if we're, we're talking of an impossibility in Linkola's sort of preferred mode of governance there would be such a thing as eco crimes right um it's interesting that even pope francis was kind of introducing something like um eco crimes in a, a recent encyclical but uh, many roman catholics i think missed his point um that uh, ecological violation and sin are, are formally identical in essence um I think many people 
assumed that um, calling something a sin was just an arbitrary designation by the Vatican, which uh, changes from pope to pope uh, in that eating meat on Friday used to be mortal sin until they decided that it wasn't, uh, just as was the case for uh, usury in the medieval era. But um, for Linkola as well, eco-crime is a formal designation of ecological impossibility um, rather than uh, an arbitrary designation founded on any one person's opinion. And if you examine um, many so-called rebellions against the eco-crimes of global capitalism on a purely formal level, they're actually just as bad in themselves. For example, um, last summer, the uh, pseudo-accelerationist uh, SJW rioters in the United States were trying to collapse the global capitalist system simply to become better consumers. They were destroying mom-and-pop businesses on Main Street just to force the government to distribute uh, universal basic income so they could turn around and buy stupid junk online to be shipped to their houses not realizing that this would only concentrate even more economic power into a handful of corporate monopolies in the technological industry. This is, of course, just an unclear euphemism uh, for the ecologically impossible object of a universal automation in which nobody has a job, but everybody's still a consumer. Um, Jim Rickards proved, though, that uh, universal basic income is uh, financially impossible because it would add some uh, $300 billion per year to the national debt in the United States. Yet the Keynesian multiplier actually goes negative after debt to GDP ratio surpasses 90%. Um, after a certain point, more government spending paradoxically inhibits rather than stimulates economic productivity. And the USA is well past 100% in this regard. So this is no longer even an option. Yet, um, even worse than the financial impossibility of UBI is the ecological impossibility because Linkola noted that universal automation is just an unclear way of saying that we've already um, given the roles of producer, distributor, and seller to machines. And the joke is on us because the only remaining role is that of the mindless consumer, yet that's also the easiest to automate away. And after that does occur, he warns that only the sound of robots will follow and then a deep silence because we'll all be dead by that point. And this is this is the uh, the learned helplessness that that Linkola sort of mentions, right? Right. There's a learned helplessness, uh, specifically on a on a physical level, um, because the body itself um, has vanished amidst the abstraction of ecological impossibility, precisely because it doesn't really factor into what it passes as work today. Um, You'll notice that an entire industry of uh, recreational facilities has emerged precisely because people have to try to squeeze in exercise after work by doing the same work they refused to do earlier that day when they were clocked in. Um, in uh, 2012, one company decided to just cut to the chase by introducing the medicine directly into the poison by marketing a treadmill with the computer directly attached to it. Um, needless to say, though, the uh, revolution of jogging while typing never really took off. But this shows that uh, even in our attempts to try to be healthy, we cannot help falling into ecological impossibility. It's interesting that a medieval peasant could get plenty of work with just hand tools and the daily chores on the farm. But we now require enormous facilities such as uh, winter sports in the summertime and indoor football stadiums in the winter just to play around in a half serious manner. Once again, it's an example of that sort of um, just being in a, a complete bind, you know, going to work all day and then driving 10 miles to the gym to uh, then run 10 miles on a treadmill always made me laugh but there you go um one thing i want to touch on um and i mean you know it's something that i i think is a really great articulation of how lincola once again thinks about nature and ecology is actually his views on veganism because i think obviously this is a touchy subject hence why i want to bring it up so <laughs> how does lincola view this and how does he view you know our relationship to to food because i think that's one of the most important aspects of his work is 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 how we confront daily life and how we actually understand what it is that we need to live. Yeah, I've noticed in my own experience of um, having video 
lectures on Link Law and YouTube, one of the most uh, common topics uh, to still get comments on is um, veganism, because um, Linkola does not think that forcing the entire world to go 100% vegan is the answer. And if you look at this uh, for geographical reasons alone, uh, you'll notice that it's actually impossible because um, much of the world's surface area is unfit for permaculture gardening of the sort um, currently fashionable among bolder hippies, but it is fit for grazing lands for livestock. Um, Central Asia continues to reflect this with a diet heavy on sheep, goat, and cow. Linkola noted that um, not even the human body's anatomical features support any notion of universal veganism as an unbiased examination of human teeth, bowels, etc. will reveal. Not even the problem of global overpopulation can be blamed on eating meat because it was grain surpluses it caused this. It wasn't simple fishermen like Linkola. And by the way, anyone who claims that fishing is inherently unethical tends to forget that virtually every fish in the wild will eventually be eaten by some other animal. And it is precisely part of the natural cycle for that to occur so long as one does not disrupt the natural process for the population to maintain itself. It's a very good overview. I mean, is, does does Linkola ever give any sort of practical advice to to people who you know want to start towards a a more environmentally friendly life? I mean, he's clearly quite cynical. So, do you do you think he actually sees that as an option? You know, that individual efforts will overcome this, or is he more of a we need an absolute you know shut down the we almost need like to put all the corporations on trial kind of thing. Is it is individual efforts <laughs> even a thing for Linkola? It's really interesting that um, Linkola um, explicitly endorsed centralized government and a tireless control of the citizens. He um, noted in a, a 2011 interview that um, media accusations that he favors dictatorship um, are not hyperbole at all. In fact, um, he openly admitted that even among dictatorships, the more draconian, the better. Um, this is why he did not um, entertain any possibility that adopting green lifestyles on an individual level would be enough. Um, if you do not address the central problem of uh, human overpopulation, he noted that uh, no amount of recycling, bicycling, organic gardening, or veganism will make up for the underlying problem of having 7 billion humans uh, consuming resources, uh, polluting, uh, displacing other living things from their natural habitat. And you can only really have a global reduction in a uh, human population on, on a coordinated level if you have this sort of centralization, which, of course, um, I think is the exact opposite of a lot of uh, peak oil thinkers like um you know, James Howard Kunstler, uh, Michael Rupert, John Michael Greer, who do emphasize that sort of localized individual effort. Uh, Richard Heinberg is another. Uh, Linkola really is more um, on the other extreme, I think, of saying you have to have a centralized um, totalitarian, really, a government do this. Otherwise, the, the sheer problem of overpopulation will negate if one person is living sustainably, but billions others are not. It's really going to uh, make it meaningless, unfortunately, for the for the ecosystem as uh, 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 the ecosystems on, on the global scale. Hmm. Whereabouts do you stand? Do you believe that individual efforts are worthwhile? I think uh, individual efforts certainly are worthwhile, but I um, think after living in the United States and then living in India as a two sorts of, of extremes in terms of um, especially fossil fuel per capita availability, um, there really is something to be said for the system as a whole having to function a certain way. Many things which um, would be illegal in the United States um, are still taken for granted as normal here in India, um, such as, you know, the, the, the sanitation stuff that we were discussing, um, as well as just even keeping chickens in, in my backyard would be illegal in the city of Denver. Uh, police would come and confiscate them, obviously, because they just want you spending way too much money on um, chickens from factories that lived in um, truly horrific conditions and are so unhealthy, they have to be completely cooked or you'll get very bad uh, food poisoning from uh, salmonella. But uh, backyard chicken here in India, my experience can be slightly pink because the chicken itself was not 
um, submitted to uh, incredibly unhealthy and unethical conditions during its uh, six weeks or whatever of, of life within some uh, overcrowded factory. So there really is something to be said for the whole system having to function a certain way, because even if you try to live um, sustainably in a nation like the United States, my own experience is you'll basically have to hide from the authorities who will punish you um, if you try to do things the right way. Hmm. Okay. Is there anything you would like to add about your book or about Linkola that we, you know, you feel is important that we haven't touched on? Yeah, I think uh, Linkola, I, I noted in the book, I, I called him uh, one of the greatest uh, thinkers alive today. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, interesting, I don't know the right word, that um, Linkola himself um, passed away about five days, I think, after I released this book. I released in March of uh, 2020. And um it was uh, only about five days later that, um, you know, we got the news. And um, but I, uh, I I called him one of the greatest thinkers alive um, today, uh, one of the greatest thinkers um, now, I would say, of, you know, recent memory, despite uh, being basically totally ignored by the academic industry, which is still, you know, pumping out uh, monographs on Freud, Marx and Derrida as though that's something new. Um, and I think it's precisely because Linkla is willing to um, say what is ecologically ne necessary um, precisely when it is unpalatable. You could compare him with uh, Norwegian um, deep ecologist uh, Arnes, who actually coined the term deep ecology, but wasn't willing to take it quite this far. If you read Arnes's work, he um, he pays lip service to all of the same politically correct cliches regarding, well, you can only really be a deep ecologist if you're committed to social justice, right? Um, and Linkla is not playing that game. Um, and I, I think maybe one reason for that is he was living this um, lifestyle as a simple fisherman, which he was not held hostage by certain institutional forces, which um, will inevitably force even the best intentions um, to, to have to be watered down. And I think that's what makes him such an admirable thinker in addition to producing such fascinating works, um, which I, I really look forward to the day that more of it is translated um, from Finnish into English. Yeah, me too. But I think it could be a while. I think I know a few people who are who someone who's sort of learned Finnish to a basic extent to uh, translate their the videos so there's clearly you know the the sort of the diehard fans out there um but so we can find the the book uh, the later philosophy of penty lincola by yourself on on amazon i believe yeah there's a paperback edition as well as the ebook available now on amazon okay okay uh seems like a good place to finish up so uh chad hog uh thanks very much uh, thank you so much